You are now watching Believe. Do you believe? Hello, Raider Nation. Welcome to another edition of the Believe in Raiders podcast and the Believe Podcast Network. I'm Dennis Ackerman. Pleased to be joined by former Raider great Stanford Route. Stan, how are we doing? Oh, man, we're doing pretty good. Uh, had a good time at the reunion a couple of days ago. And, uh, man, uh, we're about ready to almost go ahead and kick this thing off. And I'm so excited. And we also have a special guest as well on loan from ESPN. is Paul Gutierrez. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Guys, thanks for having me. I know it looks kind of funky here. I'm in my car, but I had to get some uh, air conditioning right on my face. It's been over 100 degrees in Vegas, and I've been, you know, it's been a long day. So, yeah, here I am. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Looking good in your car. You're looking good. All right, gents. All 32 teams had to be down to their final initial 53-man rosters on Tuesday. And I think the Raiders' two biggest moves of the day were cutting former first-round pick offensive lineman Alex Leatherwood and trading cornerback Trayvon Mullen. Paul, let me start with you. What do you think uh, were the two biggest – which one was the bigger surprise? Well, it depends upon how you define surprise because I think if you were reading the tea leaves all week long, you kind of got the sense that Leatherwood was going to be the guy. Still, it was hard to to think they were going to absorb such a huge salary cap hit by releasing him. Uh, Close to $8 million, his $15 million guaranteed salary paid out, and he was only there for one year. And as uh, much of an indictment against the former administration – as that is, it's also a huge uh, confidence boost for the new regime from owner Mark Davis telling, yeah, you know what, uh, do what you got to do. Because Josh McDaniels, Dave Ziggler, they came in and said, it doesn't matter where guys draft status is. It doesn't matter what their contracts are. If you're not part of this, if you don't, they don't see you being part of this um, team going forward, you're not going to be on this team. And you saw that with him. The Trayvon Mullen trade, that was the epitome, I think, of, of a surprise because you didn't really hear anything about that. And he never really got a chance to prove himself to the new regime. He, he missed, uh, he only played in five games last year because of the toe injury. He had a surgery in May on his foot and um, you know, he barely came back to practice this past week for the joint practices against the Patriots. So that I guess by the definition was a bigger surprise, but the bigger splash was, was Leatherwood because of being a first rounder and all the money involved there. Dan, let me ask you, as a former corner, somebody who played eight years in the NFL, were you surprised they moved Mullen? Oh, man, uh, you know, not not totally surprised, uh, only because it's not like that they have any solidified, bona fide, okay, we know that this is going to be the guy going forward, this is going to be the cornerstone or, you know, a, a magnificent or should I say just a major piece going forward within the, uh, the secondary. So I'd probably say from that standpoint, them to go ahead and just part ways with him is a little bit uh, surprising. But when given the fact of the level of player that uh, that he's become, or should I say hasn't become as of yet, that's why I'm not totally surprised by it. Yeah, and I know you've been concerned about the back end of the secondary. Paul, what do you make of the secondary with this initial 53-man roster? Well, they, they, they remade the whole thing. I mean, that was the thing was that Mullen, up until last year, while there were games where it looked like he literally needed to be carried off the field, and I don't know if he found Paul Pierce's magic wheelchair on the sideline, but he'd be <laughs> back in the game right away. Uh, last year was the first time he really missed a lot of time. Um, and it was a fresh start, a new regime. So, you know, with, with Everett, Everett and with Rock Yassin and the emergence of Nate Hobbs, it's obvious that they feel real comfortable. And Sam Webb, the UDFA, uh, they, they, they obviously feel comfortable with what they have. Now, there are so many questions throughout this roster, but looking at that secondary, and that's actually what I'm going to be writing about next week, is just trying to figure out exactly how it all fits hand in hand. And, and you know, Stan, you'd be the first to say, too, is that, you know, pass rush and coverage work hand in hand. So you know yes. that the Raiders have addressed the pass rush. The success, I believe, of, of the secondary, the cornerbacks especially, really does kind of go hand in hand with how uh, effective the pass rush is going to be up front. Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that when you just look at this new regime, it just appears to me like they have a different type of mindset. It seems like they have a different type of player that they're going for. There's a few people that I actually still know within the organization that I've had a few talks with. And it basically told me that right now the Raiders, from a scouting standpoint and just going forward, they're more so looking at the heady, cerebral uh, shorter corners, the ones that got good ball skills, the ones that are durable, things like that. So maybe that also plays into a part uh, with Trayvon Mullen being shipped away as far as not fitting into the new regime or just the new thinking 
the new yeah. scouting process of what they're actually looking for whenever they're selecting corners or whether they're being off the street, free agency, via trade, things like that. All right, let me get a read in here and then we'll continue this conversation. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports, contests, and events with first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, e sports, and the even golf. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports information from live in game betting, props, and futures. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to join today and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code BLEAV50 to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, Paul, let's get back to the offensive line now and tell me what does it look like September the 11th uh, against the LA Chargers? Yeah, I, I think it's going to have a few more faces on there, actually. The fact that they only have eight. Offensive linemen on the initial roster that that kind of struck me, and and the fact that they have five running backs plus a, a fullback, there there's some some wiggle room here. Whether they they scour the waiver wire, check a look and see what the Patriots are doing on their offensive line because these two franchises are now walking hand in hand, and and mm -hmm. and uh, there's somebody there that I think they can find um, right here right now. I would say the starting offensive line going left to right is Colton Miller at left tackle. Uh, Parham, the their the first ever pick draft pick of this regime, a third rounder. He's going to be at left guard. Andre James at center. Uh, Cotton, who's kind of like been the 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 revelation uh, camp story at right guard, and and uh, and I, I do believe it's going to be Illuminor at, at right tackle. Even though it seems to me he kind of fits better as a swing tackle, but he's your best shot right now. I do believe they got a lot of hope for Munford to, to come back from his injury to take over that right tackle spot, which would free up Illuminor to be more of the swing tackle. Um, but but it's it's going to be real interesting to see exactly how this thing plays out because, as we all know, the initial 53-man roster, it basically is the same thing you're going to see in week one, but it's the back end of the roster that gets a lot of tinkering going forward. And with the offensive line in particular, having only eight guys uh, on this initial 53 tells me it sets off sirens really that there's more to come here in the next uh, 10 days or so. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Stan, how confident are you in that offensive line? Uh, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a glowing <laughs> with uh with confidence in that offensive line, but I do believe that based on Josh McDaniels learning from his growing pains with being the head coach for the Denver Broncos and then also uh him coaching the St. Louis at the time St. Louis Rams learning from his mistakes and being with Bill Belichick for so long and the reason why I say all of that is to say I remember back in 2012 there was uh two games in a row I was with the Houston Texans at the time and two games in a row JJ Watt won defense player of the year that year and then Alden Smith was also one of the top sack artists in the league at the time back in the 2012 season I think he he had 18, 19 sacks, and for two straight weeks in a row, two straight weeks, I want to say it was a Monday night and then a Sunday night game for the New England Patriots, and neither one of them even breathed on Tom Brady, and that's because Tom Brady getting the ball out quick, finding ways to go ahead and thwart that pass rush, and I'm hoping that Josh McDaniels can take that same ideology, can take that same type of mindset as far as getting the ball out quick, sometimes having max pro where you keep both tight ends or maybe a fullback or a running back in to go ahead and chip an outside edge rush or something like that to go ahead and give Derek Carr more time if he's trying to do a five or a seven step drop and things like that. That's why I have a little bit of confidence in the coaching, the schematics part of it that the Las Vegas Raiders will still be able to find success on the offense side of the ball. Paul, how were surprised were you that this regime did not address the offensive line in the offseason through a trade or even free agency? Very. Uh, if for no other reason that that was the glaring need coming in, right? I mean, Derek Carr was sacked 40 times last year, the second most uh, of his career, um, and everybody knew. And, and they did address it, so to speak. I mean, their first ever draft pick was a guard uh, who can play center. Uh, in Parham. Uh, they also got Mumford in the seventh round. So technically they addressed it, I suppose. But the way I kind of look at it now, guys, is they either had too much, you know, worst case scenario, so to speak, they either had too much faith in Alex Leatherwood or they were asleep at the wheel. 
So whatever it is, yeah. here we are. So now you got to figure it out going forward. And, and Stanford, you, he's exactly right. That's exactly, you know, I talked to Lincoln Kennedy about this, uh, uh, all pro right tackle for, for the, the Raiders mm -hmm. when they went to the Super Bowl. And, sure. and oh yeah, my co-author my co on his book. So there's the cheap <laughs> plug for that right now too. If these walls mm -hmm. could talk from Triumph Books. Um, but he said the same thing. That is what they're going to have to do to, to take care of this offensive line, which may not be able to take care of Derek Carr. He's going to have to draw up the quick hitting plays coming out of there. Now, doing it, drawing it up, and executing it are three different totally things. But there's a reason you've got all these shiny jewels at all the skill positions. You still need that offensive line to give him time because none of it matters if Derek Carr is running for his life. And we've seen how things kind of fall apart when Derek gets uncomfortable back there. So they're going to have to draw up some plays for the quick hits, the slants, the sluggos if they're open, and just kind of go from there. Why are they so high on Munford? What have you seen from him? He's a big physical, physical talent. He's a specimen, if nothing else. And, and, and you feel bad for the kid, and I call him a kid because he's a rookie. But you see the one highlight where he just got absolutely pancaked in, in a game against Michigan, I believe. Um, but, you know, he just seems like somebody who just kind of gets it. And he has the skill set, the confidence, the demeanor, all of that. They really like that about him. And, and he was getting a lot of first team reps before he got hurt uh, in the exhibition season. So uh, he got hurt right after Brandon Parker did. And, and it just kind of de -es it escalated really from there. And you saw that's when Leatherwood's confidence was gone. And, and with Leatherwood, it really, to me, came down to if he's not starting for you, he can't really be a swing tackle either. You can't imagine putting him out there on the left side. So what, where is he? Where, what is he worth to you? And, and you saw today with, the Raiders actually waving him, which is, you know, you sit back and you think about it. It really is shocking, but not all that surprising. Another thing I thought was surprising and Stan, you can take this one. I mean, they kept five running backs. I mean, Jacobs, Abdullah, Bolden, Brown, and white. Well, think about the new England Patriots. <laughs> you see how they pretty much won that Super Bowl against the Atlanta Falcons off of a lot of the uh, running back receptions or just running backs out of the backfield. So that's not something that's completely surprising. Like I said, it's pretty much New England Patriots West within a lot of the regime, the head coach, the GM coming over from New England. And obviously they're going to take some of that Bill Belichick type of philosophy. So that's something that's not uber surprising to me just because Josh Jacobs is somebody who obviously he's kind of like a bull in a China shop, somebody that you can use for those tough yards, big, strong running back. But is he going to be the most effective out of the backfield? No, he's not. So you got to be able to have other guys who have those talents, somebody that you can use on third down that can also go ahead, chip the defense end and then also get out in space and be able to make plays if Derek Carr is not able to be able to is not going to be able to make passes down the field and be able to turn a third and eight swing pass into a third down conversion for first down so that's not something that is completely surprising because we all know in this league now it's not about the 220 pound running back anymore you got to be able to catch out of the backfield you got to be able to create that mismatch against a linebacker or a safety or what have you so uh in conclusion once again that that's something that, yeah, it's probably a little bit unheard of, but as far as what I know New England to be, and now it being New England West, it's not something that is really making me jump out of my chair. Paul, what do you think the odds are all five are still on the roster week one? I think, yeah, I think, um, and I always say, I hate when I say I think, right? We're supposed to know, so to speak, but my, my educated, educated guess. guess here, guys. My educated guess is that is where you can find that one extra roster spot for another offensive lineman. Somebody Absolutely. in that room, uh, whether it's Britton Brown, uh, gets uh, dinged up here in practice. They, you know, they're able to put him on IR now, and he could come back in four weeks, and you get that extra roster spot for that ninth offensive lineman. That's my educated guess. I think that's where you can actually find that extra spot. I mean, five running back. I mean, it's six, really, when you talk about the fullback, Jakob sure. Johnson as well. So it's just it's overkill. But it's also to get a, the initial 53, man, it's a way to save those guys because they must have thought that somebody was going to swoop in and sign Britton Brown because uh, he showed yeah. a lot in the preseason. But, Stan, as you saw when you were playing, I mean, most of the guys that led the Raiders in stats offensively uh, didn't secure them any spots because you knew who they were. So, to me, that's that's where you can find that extra spot um, for, an, for another offensive lineman here in the next week or so. 
All right. The Raiders actually kept all six of their draft choices, plus four undrafted players <clears throat> who made the roster. It's a couple linebackers, Butler and Masterson, and then cornerback Sam Webb. And then, Paul, help me out with his name. The safety, Isaiah. Is it Paolo Isaiah... Mao? Is it Paolo Mao? Paolo Mao. Paolo Mao. Yeah, USC guy. Yeah. Uh, those... Yeah, he, and, and he was impressive. He was impressive as well. And, and the fact that they had – four UDFAs make this initial 53 man is kind of surprising because I know back in the day uh, when Mark Davis and, and, you know, when Cliff Branch was still with us and Willie Brown and, and George Eggs and a lot of the old school guys, they would all get together with, with Mark Davis and they would have a pool as to which UDFA is going to make the initial 53 yeah. man. <laughs> so if they still do that, then I don't know if they're spreading the wealth if everybody won or if nobody won, because, you know, there's there's a couple UDF UDFA's I didn't think would make it. Uh, I, I was really intrigued with Paolo Mao. I didn't have him on my 53 man, but but not surprised that he made it because he is a big dude, and they need big dudes in the back of that secondary, especially big dudes that can cover. And as we've seen with Jonathan Abram, that is his Achilles heel. So we're going to see now exactly him get pushed by somebody who is younger, cheaper, and really a little bit bigger as well. Dan, what was the most undrafted free agents that made the Raiders during your playing days? Do you remember? Oh, man. Um, it couldn't have been any more than two or three uh, just off the top of my head uh, that I can think of because, you know, you got obviously people that will be on the practice squad, things like that. But as far as active roster, I'd probably say no more than about maybe two or three. If that, that wasn't something that was in abundance back then at that time. But obviously we see as the, as the league has gone younger, cheaper, uh, so it's it's a great way to get cheap labor, having those undrafted free agents make the team. And I know, Paul, yeah, I know you're laughing at it, and yeah. I shouldn't talk like that. I shouldn't say that, but that's the unfortunate truth of this yeah. league is that if a team can go ahead and get cheaper, if they can get younger at the same time, they're definitely going to take that route rather than paying an older player, paying him a higher salary, things like that, and then also having less upside as, quote-unquote, the young guy. Right. Paul, the 10 rookies, is this the most that the Raiders have had in your time covering them? Can you remember where they've had that many? You know, that's a good question. I need to go back and take a look to see for, as far as initial 53 man go. But I do know that this is the first time since 2014 that every single Raider traffic made the initial 53 man. And that 2014 class was nice. I mean, that's the Khalil Mack, Derek Carr, Gabe Jackson, Jelly Ellis. That, yep. That's that draft class. And uh, Reggie McKenzie won an executive of the year based off that draft class basically and they that's the first team that went to the playoffs in 16 the first time they'd gone to the playoffs since 02 um so it's the most since then yeah that's a good question because i'm going to go back and and take a look and see if this is the most rookies because if it is again it, it just shows it's more of a sign of of the um autonomy really that this new regime has been given by mark davis and your rookie class how many were in it Oh, wow. Well, let me see myself. It was Fabian Washington. It was Andrew Walter. It was Kirk Morrison. It was uh, Ricky Riddle. Uh, uh, it was Antosh Hawthorne. We had Isaiah Ikejuba. Uh, those, I mean, those. that's about seven or eight just off the top of my head. Right. I think we – Chris Carr. He was another one. Uh, right. So probably – and Isaiah – or we called him Ike, Chris Carr, they weren't draft picks. But everybody else I just mentioned, they were all draft picks. So I'd probably say just off the top of my head, probably about a solid 10, 11. Hmm. Part of my uh, my 2005 rookie class. Draft class was, I believe we had all seven rounds uh, that were drafted. So, uh, so I might be forgetting one person, but that was pretty much the gist of my, uh, my rookie class. Hmm. Paul, those 10 rookies, who makes the biggest impact, do you think? Well, it's got to be one of the, the guys that they, they drafted early, or at least you would hope. And I don't know how much, quote-unquote, impact a left guard can make, but mm -hmm. if, if, Parham, if Dylan Parham's not afraid to mix it up in training camp and the only fight that we saw was with Max Crosby, the $99 million man, then, then he's ready to make an impact. Um you know, there's there's a lot of things here at play, and, and it, it's strange because this really reminds me a lot, Stan, of the 2012 team. Because mm -hmm. coming off the 2011 season where Hugh Jackson had that offense humming and everything just kind of fell apart in that last game, Hugh lost his mind in the press conference after <laughs> thusly lost his job. Um, but coming in, remember, it was, okay, well, 
Dennis Allen is a defensive minded coach. He's going to fix the defense. The offense yeah. is going to keep humming. Everything's good. And I remember predicting at the time, I, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be better because we don't know. There's so many unknowns. Oh, Paul, you're a hater. You don't know what you're talking about. Get out of here. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, what happened? Dennis Allen comes in and what's the first thing he, he does? He doesn't fix the defense. He wrecks, he wrecks the offensive line. He wrecks yeah. Darren McFadden. And then he tries to fix the defense, and that thing just blew up in his face too. So I'm not there. saying that's what Josh McDaniels is going to do, but there are just so many questions. And when you've got 10 rookies on this initial 53 men, when you only have two quarterbacks on your 53 men, when you only have eight offensive linemen, which is the Achilles heel of this team, you just don't know. And I'm not saying it's going to be a bad thing. I'm just saying I can't predict it's going to be a good thing either. Okay, so let me ask you this. We know the skill position is the strength of this football team. What would be next, do you think? Well, I, it's got to be the defensive line, if for nothing else, the sheer yeah. numbers there. 11 defensive linemen on an initial 53-man. I mean, that to me, it, in a normal time, you say, man, that's overkill. Why, why do you need so many? You could, you could have more DBs. You could have more line – only five linebackers, you know. So, but – you got Max Crosby coming off the season he did. Chandler Jones might be on his way to the to the Hall of Fame. You got two big beefy guys down low in Hankins and Bilal Nichols. That should be, again, should be <laughs> the uh, another strength here because they're going to disrupt things. And, you know, watching in camp, it's one of those glass half full, glass half empty kind of a thing because Max Crosby dominated every single day in training camp. So is that good for him or is that bad for the offensive line? It's like, Stan, if you're out there and you're dominating one-on-ones, well, that's great for you. But what does that say about the wide receivers? Absolutely. You know, especially when you're only going against your own guys. So, to me, the defensive line should be uh, a strength of this team um, as much as the offensive line is a question mark. Stan, what do you make of the defense? Oh, I can tell you this. I feel that Max Crosby, Chandler Jones – other guys up front are going to have to have monster years just because I did not see enough moves made to the back end to really give me extreme levels of confidence. But we all know that a corner's best friend is a pass rush. And we all know Max Crosby having an all pro season. Chandler Jones, just like Paul Gutierrez said, uh, very well may be on his way to the Hall of Fame. They're both going to have to play at a high level to, I think, go ahead and augment, or should I say, just help that back end because. I do not think they're going to be able to hold up. And you got the Kansas City Chiefs, Pat Mahomes. You got the Los Angeles Chargers, Justin Herbert. And now you got, what's his name over there in uh, in Denver? <laughs> Russell Wilson coming out of Seattle. So that's why you're going to see some high-flying, high-scoring games within the AFC West this year. And there's going to be a time or two where the secondary is going to fall on them, where they're going to have to find ways to get off the field, be able to make plays and things like that. And I'm not sure that they can do that because clearly they didn't do it last year. Only had six INTs out of the entire season. So – you get you have a lot of unproven players in that back end and for the level of confidence, for the level of intrigue, the level of, should I say, just hoopla, the roar, everything surrounding the organization right now, making it to the playoffs last year. Now you got Devontae Adams coming in. You got right. Derek Hart's best friend coming from college. You now have Chandler Jones coming over. There's a lot of optimism within Raider Nation right now. So that's why I say it's going to fall on the shoulders of that back end. And I think that the only way to augment, the only way to help them is – that pass rush has to be ferocious and being able to get after the quarterback. That way they can go ahead and just simply stop the pass from even being thrown versus depending on those DBs getting the ball out the air. Okay, this is a question for either one of you. What is the difference between when a team says they've released a player and they have waived a player? Can you guys explain that one to me? <laughs> or is it just semantics? <laughs> I feel like I, uh... I know... I feel like yeah. I know that answer. I feel like I do, but Paul, I'll let you. I'll let, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and go first. I I just always put cut, even though that's kind of harsh. So and so is no longer with it. It's like it's like you know, if you and I have a job and we no longer work the next day, well, we got fired. So you know, but it has something to do with seasons accrued. Uh, if you haven't played X amount of years, you're waived. If you're a veteran of some sort, you're released. Uh, if you're waived. You then, before you can go someplace else, have to clear waivers, meaning nobody else in the league can claim you. Um, so, again, if I knew that exact number off the top of my head, I could tell you that. It, but it changes all the time without throughout the CBAs. No, it doesn't it, Stan? 
I, I, I don't know if it changes over time. Okay. I just know this. As far as the difference between being released and being waived, as far as I know, whenever you're waived, that's when that's when basically it's a that's when basically you have let me see how I can word this. Uh being released is just being released, like flat out release. Okay. Being yep. waived is a situation where another team has the opportunity to go ahead and basically pick up your contract, uh, per se. And Every I believe what all 31 teams like have the opportunity to go ahead and you know pick you up off of waivers per se, and right. they can do that or they cannot do that. Now, then if you clear waivers, then now you've been officially released. Uh, and, but being released initially is basically not having to go or them not putting you through the waivers. And I forget exactly what why why teams will go ahead and put you through waivers first I, I forget the reason it's got something to do with money something to do with salary cap uh something like that so essentially in a lot of ways if you are picked up off of waivers it's almost like the team that just released you almost kind of traded you to this new team because they're picking up your contract per se exactly. now they're not getting a draft pick they're not getting anything in return so it's almost kind of like a pseudo trade per se. So that's the uh, the biggest difference between uh, being released or being waived. But the end result is that you're no longer on the original <laughs> team. <laughs> that's, the end, that's the end result. I was – yeah, I was working yeah. here yesterday. Now I'm not working here exactly. today. Exactly. Yeah, so, it, I mean, it, it all equates to the same thing. Yeah. All right, Paul. You cover this team every day. You've seen him uh, in spring camp. You've seen him in OTAs. You've seen him in the fall camp. Vegas has the over under at eight and a half wins. What are you going with and why? Uh, I got him at nine and eight. So that's the over. Um, simply because I just, there's just so many questions. I, I think they may actually be a better team than they were last year, but the wins aren't going to be there like they were 10 and seven last year. If for no other reason than there's to me, there's just so many questions about this that you don't know. Yeah, they went 4-0 and in the preseason, and I got into it with fans on Twitter, which I probably shouldn't have done. But, oh, you're so negative, and you don't, what about the good things that are happening? I'm like, you mean the good things that are happening by second and third stringers and guys that aren't even going to be on this team? <laughs> you know, I, I, see, I see the philosophy at play, and that's a good thing. Uh, they looked a lot more disciplined. There was very few uh, penalties as in years past with this team. So that's a good thing. But we didn't see Derek Carr hooking up with Devontae Adams in a game situation. We, and we saw it in, in uh, the joint practice, but we didn't see it in a game. We didn't see, uh, you know, Max Crosby and Chandler Jones, you know, crushing the, uh, their tackles and coming in and collapsing the pocket in the game situation. So we don't know. And that's why I'm, I'm sticking with that. And the schedule is brutal, too. I could see them getting off to a slow start, yeah. catching fire mm -hmm. in the middle of the season, and then just kind of running out of gas down the stretch. And that is not being a hater. That no. is not being a, you know, it's being more realistic than anything simply because, we just don't know. I would feel more comfortable, guys, if Rich Bisaccia was still the coach and they brought guys in. Not saying that he's a better coach, but simply because there's a known factor at play there. Uh -huh. There's so, so much unknown right here and right now, and, and that's with all due respect as well. So 9-8, and eight, likely that means you're going to finish in last place in the AFC West. You're still going to finish over 500, but you're likely going to be in last place and you're going to yeah. miss the playoffs. Who do you like coming out of the, that division, Paul? Yeah, I always – it's to me, it's a, it's like been a decade now, right, that the Chargers always seem to have the most talent in the division, but Chargers are going to charge her. They kind of find a way to beat themselves <laughs> a lot. Yep. So, um, you know, if I had to make a pick, pick right here right now, I'd say the Chargers have the most talent, and, and uh, we saw how explosive they can be. The, the Chargers uh, should win the division. The Chiefs came back to the pack a little bit, and I'm not really still all that sold on Denver. Their defense is still nice but their offense should take a, a leap forward with Russell Wilson and, and the Raiders. I mean, they've got probably the, the best skill position players in the division, but that offensive line, man, it just scares me. Stan, what do you make of Paul's prediction for the AFC West? Oh, I mean, like, I can't make anything of it, and this is no disrespect. Don't take that disrespectfully. Uh, the reason why I say <laughs> that I can't – no, the reason why I say I can't is because – and in, in both of you guys – Please chime in and, t and and give your assessment on what, what I'm about to say. If you were to tell me that the division was going to go Chargers, Chiefs, Raiders, Broncos, yeah, and then also told me it would go Broncos, Raiders, uh, Chiefs, Chargers, turn it directly upside down, one through four, I think that 
there's no scenario that would surprise me within the AFC West this year, just because like what Paul was saying that I think the Raiders have gotten better, but it may not show up in the win category because you see the entire uh, division getting a lot better. Obviously the chiefs coming back to the pack a little bit, but still having the best quarterback within the yeah. division or some would say within the league. So that's why the chiefs could still very well win the division, the Broncos, they had a great defense. They got good playmakers. The only thing they were missing was what the quarterback, they shore that up. The Los Angeles Chargers have a lot of talent. And guess what? They just don't know how to close out games. But now they have who? Khalil Mack. Now they got J.C. Jackson. You got Derwin James, now the highest paid safety in NFL history. Oh, yeah, you still got Joey Bosa. So right. that's why when you look at this division, I would not be surprised one through four. Or if you turn it upside down, the same team that was predicted to, to lose the division or be last if they wind up winning it just because I think it's going to be stacked that tight. I think that yeah. you're going to see a team probably go, let's say, eight, nine, nine and seven and simply not make the playoffs or just be last in the division, not because they're a bad team, but just because that's how tight it's going to be. So if we're equating it to college football, I would probably say right now the AFC West is the SEC of the NFL. Yeah, it's, it's a shame, too. It's almost like the AFC West is going to cannibalize itself. Yes, by beating that's itself a perfect up. word, cannibalism. And and they're not going to get it. It's like all, those all four teams should probably get in the playoffs, but because they're going to beat each other up, somebody from a, a weaker division is going to slide right in, and that's that's the unfortunate thing. But whoever comes out of there is going to be that much more ready Battle for adjust, the postseason. Yeah. Sure. There's no team within the AFC West that if you told me they're going to miss the playoffs this year, I would actually be shocked. Right. All right, last question. Or they could rep or they could represent the AFC in the Super Bowl too. It, exactly. It's that tight. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. I wouldn't be shocked by any by any of those measures. All right, last question for both of you. Just give me one word answer. How many wins does it take to win the AFC West? Paul? Ooh. I'm going to say 12 to win it. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing because so you're going to see teams beat up on each other. So yep. I don't think you're going to see 14 and three. I don't think you're no, going to see yeah. 15 and two because it's going to be so much cannibalism. I'd probably say 12. I would agree with you. Hey, Paul, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it having you yeah, on. Yeah, Paul, appreciate you, man. Got to do it again. Hey, absolutely. And anytime I can join you from the El Pollo local parking lot in Vegas, <laughs> I'm, I'm down. All good, After man. Happy, happy to have you on. Got to do it again, man. <laughs> be safe out there. All right, guys. Be good. All right, Raider Nation. That's going to do it for another edition of the Believe in Raiders podcast presented by Bet Online. For my partner, Stanford Route, our guest, Paul Gutierrez. I'm Dennis Ackerman. Thanks so much for listening, and may all your punts find the coffin corner.